Hello, I'm Philip Stoughton. I'm at Apex 2015 and I'm joined by Charlie Barnhart of Charlie Barnhart and Associates. Charlie, hey, great to see you again. Good to see you. What I wanted to explore with you was kind of what's going on in the market in terms of mm -hmm. geographies. Constantly hearing of new regions. We were at the Zona facility opening in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talking about Vietnam. Yeah. What are you seeing overall in terms of movement in the big picture? Um, well, I, I think underlying the, uh, you know, I'll give my observations on the movement. Let me just, let, let's lay some baseline stuff down mm. relative to where everybody's at today because it's really influencing that, you know, how things are shifting around. So, a, as you know, I mean, everybody knows, uh, if you look at the major regions around the world, starting with Europe, you know, Europe's having a tough time. We're still fighting sovereign debt issues. The growth rates are anemic at best, mm. right? And some of the places, you know, some are still strong. and. Uh, I'm sure you saw, saw some of the recent stuff. I see all the data. There's some good Eastern European solutions mm. that are strengthening and yeah. stuff. Some of them are falling off, but you know, so we still we still need to reconcile these issues in in Europe. But um, uh, I think it will work out. I think we're three or five years out from a major economic recovery, but that's where we're at there. So that's that's one of the regions that's probably not getting as much focus yeah. as it should. I think so because of these <coughs> issues. The next one is, um, of course, in North America. So the NAFTA countries, you know, Canada, United States, Mexico, you know, they're enjoying a renaissance. We see, we have seen finally, you know, repatriation of a lot of work back into this region. Um, uh, Canada is doing better than I really expected over the last two years. I've been working with a lot of folks up there, and I saw a number of projects that I really didn't think would go into Canada that did. And so that was good. That was positive. U.S. is doing reasonably good. The growth rates are not fantastic, but they are what they are, you know, mid, single digits, or maybe just a little bit lower than that. Mexico is still expanding. Uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest. I've been spending a lot of time in Mexico, and um, so you, there's a lot of new stuff going on. Sh some of them are sheltered organizations, some of them are foreign subsidiary operations. But I think that's going to continue for at least the next uh, three or four or five years and grow, and that's the area that I see the largest growth in right now. And then, if we shift over to Asia, the problems are uh, varied and many. Mm. Uh, some geographies are better off, some are still in their expansionary kind of uh, structures, uh, but there's some problems, there's some problems. And when you look at it overall as, a, as an area, it looks more like a meltdown situation than it does into okay. a restructuring kind of thing. So I think some of these operations, uh, so some of these geographies and some of the operations embedded in them are, going to, are really going to be shifted out. Right. And so a classic case, and I'm, I haven't been able to get on a plane and go recently, but Thailand, there's something going on, something wrong with Thailand right, right. now. Thailand, ha Thailand has, at least in our industry, has a negative growth rate right now. And so work is, there's more work coming out of Thailand than is going into it. And Thailand has a lot of great solutions. Mm. There's a lot of good manufacturing space in Thailand. So the question is, what the heck's going on there, yeah. right? You know? And, uh, and, and, and other locations. We, we talked just a little bit ago about Vietnam. Mm. Vietnam's a, you know, a, a potentially emerging location, but it's a relatively small country, fairly small population, lacks significant infrastructure. Mm. But some of the people have gone in, have been reasonably successful, and uh, they've been um, you know, contributory to the development of the infrastructure in the country, and I, and I think that's a good thing. Yeah. But long term, it's not gonna be another China. No. You know, yeah. Uh, but the Philippines and Indonesia potentially could be. Yeah, there are some yeah. nice companies down there doing there some are. decent stuff. IMI, yeah. for example, I like exactly. the way they're, they're, yeah. they've been growing. So, so what about what about I mean, the the elephant in that region, China itself? Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. what do you see going on there? I'd, I've been talking to people that are very well connected to government there, and mm -hmm. there seems to be this this thing where they're saying, okay, well, we're happy to let some of the real low value, um, high volume stuff go. And I'm thinking, I've seen this movie before, right. and it doesn't right. end well. That's right, doesn't end well. So uh, I think that um, China came up so fast, uh, and was impacted so fast by the tributary factors of that rapid, rapid mm. growth, right? Inflation and employment issues and you know, all those kinds of things. Um, it needs to be reconciled out. I, I, these guys are really good at what they do. Mm. You know, some of them you know, may not be at the quality levels that you know, are compatible with the rest of the world, but a lot of them are. Yeah. If you take the top 15 contract <coughs> manufacturers in the world, yeah. or service, global service providers, yeah. 
uh, you know, as we both know, the majority of that work is there. You take Foxconn out, you've removed half the industry, mm. right? Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I think there's still great opportunity there. I think, I think what's really going to happen, though, is the original ODMs that are in that top 15 of global manufacturing service providers are pretty much fed up with the, with the manufacturing services industry. Yeah. And my forecast, which I actually made here at the show, is we're going to see a couple of these people um, um, walk out of that um, kind of activity or right. walk away from it. And do what? Do their own products. Okay. You know, so HTC, Lenovo's, exactly, yeah. that kind of stuff. They're going to follow after so their Huawei, big brothers. The Huawei yeah. Huawei's. Huawei, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good one, yeah. yeah. But, and it's, that's an inevitability. I mean, this trend has been on the table for quite a while. Yeah. You know, the cards were played. It was just yeah. a matter of what the whole cards were. And yeah. I think they're just about to flip them over. Yeah. So uh, there's going to be a big chunk of capacity go out of China. But yeah. I think that may actually make it more, uh, a more stable place. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and sort and of settle down there. Mm -hmm. Kind of settle the regionalization down. Regionalization mm -hmm. worldwide. I think so China's still a wonderful solution. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's... Not it's, for everybody, but... No, but for the right... For the right people. And, and it is, the right yeah. people. Mm -hmm. And again, it's got a growing consumer market. So there's, there's a domestic market that's absolutely. improving as well. Absolutely. So just stepping back, I mean, as, a, as I mentioned, um, Costa Rica, and we're here, here uh -huh. about different mm -hmm. regions, mm -hmm. different places like that. Without being specific to a region, if you were a contract manufacturer and you were looking to choose a region to manufacture, maybe one that doesn't have already some large players in, what are the key factors in making that decision? What makes a good manufacturing location? Yeah. So you, you need to, um, there, there's probably half a dozen items, but the big ones for me, I, you know, uh, are, uh, are related to the society in which you're going to do this, you know, and it's not just, it's not just in a specific country, but in a region, uh, you know, uh, uh, that includes a bunch of people that kind of share a common yeah. culture. And so, um, you know, if you look at, I think Western Europe, again, is a classic example in this. So you have a whole bunch of different, you know, uh, different uh, countries. And you know, from a, from a U.S. perspective, you got these little countries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they look like states. You look yeah. like states, right? But but they do <coughs> share a common culture. They even have different languages. But they they yeah, they work it. together. Yeah. It's the whole you, you know uh, European Union kind of concept thing. But anyways, what you, what you've got here is you've got countries that are <coughs> highly developed infrastructures. Mm -hmm. They have uh, embedded educational systems that are functional. Yeah. Right. Uh, they have rule of law. Yep. They have uh, um, a banking that is consistent and transparent, mm. right? They have stable governments. You know, these are my big kind yeah, of issues. Big key yeah, factors. Big key factors. So it's easy. Business is challenging, but it's not impossible. And you can go to anywhere and run, mm. run a business. Clearly, yeah. the world knows this. But, but if you go to places that have these kind of attributes, it's a lot easier and a very higher, a much higher probability of success for your business if you can rely on these things. You know, international banking kind of yeah. relationships and all these other things yeah, I talked about, stable governments. Yeah. You know, currencies are always going to yeah. fluctuate. You know, there's always going, we're always going to bump around against each other because this, you know, you know, Spain is not real happy with France. You yeah. know, what, whatever, whatever it is, it it's is. Been going it's been going over for two thousand okay. years, yeah, but it works. Yeah. As long as it works, if you know how the system works, yeah. you can work in the system. Mm. The problem I see, and, and the one that, you know, I mean, probably provides me more, you know, business at Charlie Barnard Associates, is not these issues. It's the issues where people go into highly, um, I don't know, probable, you know, or, I'm sorry, low probability locations and yeah. try to make a go of it, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's volatility. So, and it's, you know, volatility, we have unstable governments, we lack rule of law, the banking yeah. system's corrupted or ineffective, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever. So, but they want to go there because they think this is going to be the next big area <coughs> because you can get labor for six yeah. cents, you know? Yeah. So if you want really, really low cost labor, you go to sub-Saharan yeah, Africa. Africa. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But is anybody going to do that? No. If they do it, they're foolish, right? Because yeah. it lacks all these requirements to yes. run a business. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, so we got to give up for, you know, I've been talking, you, you know, we, we probably, me and you have talked about this probably for 30 years yeah, or yeah. something, right? But we, we got to quit chasing low cost, low -cost labor. labor. I yeah. looked at, for a friend of mine this morning, I looked at a quote um, that they're having quoted out there, out quoting yeah. it. And the labor content on this, on this particular assembly, beautiful assembly, very nicely done, is 4.6%. Is right. 4.6% of cost is in yeah. labor. And that includes the overhead. 
Okay. You know, so what, what are we doing yeah, here? So who cares? Yeah, it's $12,000 board, and, yeah. you know, and 4.6% of that is labor. It's labor. Is labor. Yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah, I think we do need to, we do need to get past that situation and, and, and think about, you know, what, what really matters in terms of those locations. Do you think there is, there is trend in terms of manufacturing excellence? Do you think um, regions are improving the way they manufacture and actually driving those labor costs down? Mm -hmm. We hear all this stuff in Germany about Industry 4.0 and right, right. mass automation or custom automation, different things different trends and I thought my view was always that the OEMs were better at investing in that than the EMS guys because the EMS guys have got these wafer thin margins. Oh that's true, yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody really driving manufacturing excellence to make us more efficient so we can yeah. manufacture in higher cost environments. You know, um, I, I think, I think, and I think that's on both sides. I, I, I agree with you on the OEMs. The OEMs are, are, are really embedded in this, you know, manufacturing 2.0, 3.0, yeah. 4.0, all this stuff. And there is a lot of new technologies and there's a lot of um, contro control elements that have been added into the processes mm. that we haven't <coughs> seen before, you know. Um, but the, but the EMS industry too has all, has also been bucking up on their equipment, mm. on their engineering capabilities, uh, both from a design and processing perspective. They're doing a lot more, um, what I would call lab type <laughs> work than they yeah. used to do. Yeah. So I think there's been a huge, I think it's been, there's been a, in the last ten years there's been a huge increase in the capabilities yeah. of the manufacturing, and it's worldwide. It's pretty much everywhere, not in any particular geography. The issue is that we, we're literally. Uh, working on a 1% problem. Yeah. This isn't the problem. Technology yeah. and the ability to manufacture isn't the problem. The problem is the business relationship and the solution is broken. Yeah, yeah. which you have been saying for yeah, 30 years. Yeah, for a long time. And they yeah. haven't fixed it yet. They haven't fixed it. Yeah. And so what we have is, you know, the we have the outsourcing dividend mm -hmm. uh, with the consumer, right? Yeah. And uh, we have the co escalating costs of production from the producer. <laughs> And at some point, uh, we need to fix that basic business issue. That's, that's the problem. It's yeah. not the technology. Technology is, this industry, all, all of us worldwide, is so good it's almost incomprehensible. Yeah. I remember when I was a young engineer, right? Yields were measured in, you know, whether a good yield was 60, 65 yeah. percent. Today, it's a, it, you know, it's a fraction it's of a percent. Per million, isn't yeah, it? it's parts per million. Yeah, it's parts per million. Yeah, I mean, it's, million, yeah. you know, we don't talk about. It, we achieved a 65% yield on this You'd path. You'd be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, you'd be in a lot of trouble. You, you yeah. wouldn't have a job, right? Yeah. You wouldn't have a job if you had a 96% yeah. yield, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So okay. the industry does a good job, and what we got to do is we got to fix the relationship, yeah, the relationship between the parties. With the That's where parties. it's broken. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. I, I look at a lot of the... Um, a lot of the, the big tier ones, and you talk about maybe some of the Chinese ones moving out of, um, mm -hmm. of EMS and drifting through towards the OEM path. Um, but what I what I what I I see concerned some of the larger larger guys is they're they're trying to get their their, their stock cap up and Correct. they have a very yeah. low low multiplier and the industry is seen to have that low multiplier. How do yes. they how do they shift that? Is there is there a way that they can shift that, or do they have to become an OEM to do that? Yeah, no. Well, uh, I think there's a couple. That, that's a really big deal. I mean, that, that is the that's the um, you know 900-pound uh, gorilla in the room. Mm. This issue, but uh, they're, uh, you know what their valuations yeah. are, especially these big contractors. There's a couple. El there's a couple things that come out of these low valuations. One is they're they're really re you look at the, you look at what their capabilities are, and then you look at what their valuation is on the public market, and it's like. You yeah. could buy these companies for less than the value of their equipment in yeah. some cases, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so this is becoming <laughs> this is almost becoming an inevitability. And I yesterday here again at the show, I talked about what I thought might uh, happen over the next three to five years. And one of the, my forecasts is that I think there's a number. I don't just think this, but I believe because I've talked to so many people that there's a number of people out shopping for these big solutions right now. Mm. And what they're going to do is they're going to bring them back in house. Right. Yeah. Because about half of the senior executives that I talked to today, what we talk about, this is their OEM executives, mm. is about bringing stuff back in house. Yeah. At least some portion of it. Okay. Yeah. To control it because yeah. they, they really feel overly dependent and they know that the relationships are, are deeply, you know, damaged yeah. and flawed. <laughs> right. And, and they're, adversarial at this yeah. point. So that, that's, that's what makes them nervous. So that's, that's one of the things. Um, when we talk about, um, you know, when we talk about other elements of the business itself, 
the real solution, if you forget about the OEM for a second, the real solution for an EMS company is diversification of revenue. Yeah. And so there's all, way, all kinds of ways to diversify the revenue stream, and they've been working on this for a long time. Mm. Some of them have invested huge amounts of money in this. Yeah. The problem is it just hasn't uh, done very much for no. them. So if you're working on razor-thin margins here, you really can't diversify 5 or 6 or 7% of your revenue and expect to achieve any results. No, no, no. You've got to diversify half your revenue yeah. into a much higher level. And of, often uh, they're diversifying you know, their revenue into areas and pushing the margins down in those yeah, areas Yeah, 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 well, exactly. Which is and the, so they have the to find yeah. ways to diversify their revenue and not 5 or 6 yeah. or 7%, but 40 or 50 or 60% of their revenue. Yeah. Because they're in a commodity business. That, yeah. you know, building print circuit board assemblies and boxes is a commodity yeah. business. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with being a commodity no, manufacturer. No. Alcoa has made a <laughs> hell of a career of doing yeah. it in aluminum, right? Yeah. But they, but also Al Alcoa is a highly diversified, yeah. you know, a company. Yeah. And so these companies need to, you know, take that model and think about it. Yeah. They're yeah. not going to survive if they don't do something. Yeah, and they've got to yeah. do something different. Yeah, because they, they look at uh, an Uber or something that's got a valuation of $40 billion and yeah. think, what are we doing wrong? Yeah. It's kind what, of weird, what are we doing? We're sharing yeah. each other's car, and yeah. they make $40 billion. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Charlie, okay. pleasure to see you. Great yeah. insight. Thank you very much. Thank you time. very much. Always a pleasure. Thank you.